welcome to the 48th Annual Distinguished Research Master Awards Program. My name is Stephen David Beck, Associate Vice President for Research and Economic Development. And it's my privilege to serve as your MC for tonight's event. In a moment, I will introduce Dr. Sam Bentley, Vice President for Research and Economic Development, who will introduce our award winners. And after our DRM recipients have presented a short talk about their research, we will have an open Q&A session where we can discuss their work in more detail. Please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen to ask any questions. We will be monitoring that throughout the evening. First, I want to thank the Council on Research for their efforts in selecting this year's two distinguished faculty researchers. Today, the LSU community pauses to honor their exceptional creativity, insight, and discovery that in turn bring honor to us all. And now we look to our colleagues who have chosen LSU as their research and teaching home. The Distinguished Research Master Award has been presented to outstanding recipients since 1972. Each December, the Office of Research and Economic Development issues a call for nominations and, and the Council on Research, a 15 member advisory committee reviews the packets and gathers for an intense selection process. In 1996, the award process grew when the council recommended recognizing excellence in the arts, humanities, social and behavioral sciences, as well as excellence in science, technology, engineering and mathematics. Each Distinguished Research Master recipient is recognized in three ways. First, we honor them today with a ceremony and present them with a certificate and the university medal. Second, each recipient receives a permanent salary enhancement. And finally, the recipient's names will be added to the permanent list of their peers and a photo is hung on the wall in David Boyd Hall. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Sam Bentley Vice President for Research and Economic Development, who will introduce the DRM winners for 2020. Dr. Bentley. You need to unmute yourself. <laughs> and I'm now unmuted. I spend all day telling people that. <laughs> so good evening, everyone. And thank you so much for, uh, uh, for joining us tonight for our virtual celebration of the 48th Distinguished Research Masters at LSU. I'm excited to introduce Professor Joseph Giami and Professor Heather McKillop tonight. Dr. Joseph Giami is a Distinguished Research Master in Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics. He is a professor in the Department of uh, the LS LSU Department of Physics and Astronomy, and he's the head of the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, or LIGO, in Livingston, Louisiana. He'll talk about his work tonight and experience as part of the team that continues to detect gravitational waves opening windows into the universe. Dr. Heather McKillop is the Distinguished Research Master in Arts, Humanities, Social and Behavioral Sciences. She is the Thomas and Lillian Landrum Alumni Professor in the LSU Department of Geography and Anthropology and founder of the LSU Digital Imaging and Visualization in Archaeology, or DIVA, laboratory. She will talk about her research on the ancient coastal Maya, including 1,300-year-old wooden buildings and artifacts preserved below the seafloor in Belize. So now I'll turn it back over to, to you, Steve. Thank you. And Dr. Giami, I think uh, it's time for you to start sharing your slides and uh, hearing about your research. So I call it the Gravitational Waves in Louisiana, and it's kind of in the form of a thank you to, to um, all the support that LSU and Louisiana have given uh, my field. Um, but let's start here. Um, so, so, so the idea of modern gravity, the way we understand modern gravity is that matter and energy curve space-time, and that space-time guides motion and lengths. Um, Einstein came up with that about 100 years ago, and if you think about it, it sounds sort of circular, and indeed it is. Um, two years after he came up with the with general relativity, he, he realized that it, it would be possible to, to have, con, have solutions of his equations that could propagate his waves. Um, if you have a distribution of matter that does this, it gets sort of skinnier along one axis and, and wider along another in a periodic way, 
that can excite gravitational waves in space-time. And if you let that gravitational wave propagate through space and, and, um, and encounter another set of uh, distribution of matter, these, these purple LSU purple balls, it can cause them to do this, which is to get closer together in one dimension and longer in the other in a periodic way. So to detect gravitational waves, you have to build an observatory um, that can measure the difference between one axis and another. So this is an, over, an overhead view of LIGO Livingston. There's one arm, there's another arm, they're 90 degrees apart. And, and it has to be big because the motion is, is, is in proportion to the length. So this is, this is a wonderful uh, automation, animation that the American Museum of Natural History made a few years ago. It shows what happens when one arm is getting longer and the other one shorter and back and forth and you make a laser interferometer about, out of it. So you take two, la two, two a laser beam and separate into the two arms. It's represented here by little blobs of light. And so the light comes back earlier in one arm than, than it does in the other. And that's the way we make the measurement. Of course, this is, the arms are changing lengths by a tenth of their length. So we would call that in our field H of 0.1. This is another automation that was produced on the occasion of a discovery we made with professional animators. Um, and it shows the lights being separated by a beam splitter into two arms, reflecting off the distant, um, distant uh, mirrors, and then coming back and recombining. And if everything is perfectly still and, and balanced, um, then no light would come out of the anti-symmetric port of this detector. But if a gravitational wave comes through and, and disturbs things a little bit, there will be some light coming out of that port. And that's basically the technique, but much, much more complicated that we use. So we measure the light with photo detectors. Um, so let me come back to Louisiana for a minute. Um, uh, so uh, Bill Hamilton uh, was, was recruited to come to, to Louisiana in 1970 to construct two so-called cryogenic bar detectors, um, for one, one to be used at LSU and the other to be used at Stanford, where Bill came from. Uh, Warren Johnson joined him in the 80s and the bar was operated until LIGO had better performance. Um, these are, I couldn't find a, a, a photo with Bill and Warren both in it, so Warren won today. Um, so I, I and Gabriel Gonzalez joined LSU in 99 and 2001 respectively. So we had, we had both worked in grad school and, 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 and um, elsewhere on, on the, the technology and the science of gravitational detection using interferometers. Um, so that kind of got LSU into that game. And then kind of the fin to, to finish this book ending, Thomas Corbett joined about a, a decade ago and he's working on much more advanced kind of instrumentation and quantum non-demolition stuff for the future. Um, getting back to the, the timeline, as I mentioned on the top, the top line, 100 years ago, Einstein published his theory of general relativity. Um, and, and it, it, two years later talked about gravitational waves. It took half a century for anybody to get up the, the, uh, the nerve to try to measure these things because they're very, very tiny. Um, so Joe Weber and the University of Maryland started building bar antennas, not the cryogenic kind that Bill and Warren had, um, but room temperature bars and attempt to detect the waves. Um, about 45 years ago, the key ideas of the interferometric, interferometric antennas were developed, were being developed by Ray Weiss and others uh, of course, the, the bar work continued. Um, about 40 years ago, the NSF, by then the NSF was funding, the US National Science Foundation was funding pre-LIGO R&D. Um, and, um, and then international uh, collaborators were also working on that stuff funded by their agencies, including Glasgow in the UK and, and the Max Planck Society in Germany. Uh, MIT and Caltech got together in 1989 and proposed to build LIGO to the NSF. And then the miracle happened, which is um, just six years later, it was funded and site construction began. Um, uh, just after Hurricane Katrina, the initial LIGO was running at its design sensitivity. We ran it for two years. As, as, as luck would not have it, um, we saw nothing after two years. No, none of the sources we were looking for um, were strong enough. We made some improvements, ran for another year and a half and also saw nothing. So that's kind of a, a point to think about. It's sort of toward the end of 2010, a, a number of people have been working on this for decades and, and had nothing to show for it other than wonderful up, upper limits and beautiful instruments and, and, and delightful colleagues to work with, which I guess is not nothing. But still, we didn't have any gravitational waves bagged. Um, so luckily, the NSF and, and, and the European partners 
re-upped and, and uh, funded something called Advanced LIGO. Um, we installed that starting towards the end of 2010. By, by fall 2015, the first instance of it was working. And, um, uh, we, and we saw a signal almost right away when we ran it, which is the, the signal from two black holes. I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, the two years later, we saw a signal for the first time from, from, from a pairs of neutron stars merging. And then the year after that, we were given a plaque by the American Physical Society uh, uh, designating uh, the two LIGOs as historic physics sites. So we went from essentially seeing nothing um, to a few years later being historic. So that was quite a, um, quite a whiplash, an emotional whiplash, a wonderful one. Uh, this map quickly shows where the gravitational wave detectors are in the, uh, in the world, the two in the US, one here and one in Eastern Washington state. Um, Virgo, or sort of toward the middle, is, a, is also a long baseline detector in Italy that's joined us rec um, more recently, right? Uh, uh, and in, in running together. Geo 600 is a shorter one it's, that runs with us, but is mostly used to do advanced R&D. Cagra, all the way on the right, uh, just started observing with us um, and is working on getting its sensitivity up to where it, um, it'll be contributing great, a, a, a sufficient information that we'll be able to use it to do very detailed and, and, and uh, record-breaking sky location. And LIGO India is the new kid on the block they have their land, they have the start of funding, and they're working very hard to get that going uh, maybe in half a decade. Um, this is a slide that shows all of the logos of all the members of the LIGO Scientific Collaboration. Um, and, um, and it's wonderful to be working with such a large group of, of really talented people. And, and it would be impossible to remember who all they are without such a graph. Okay, let's get back to Louisiana. Um, in 1995, I wasn't here yet, um, but they, that's when they broke ground on the site. And this is the program they handed out with that mid 90s bitmap, Welcome to the Future. Um, and um, um, you can see that there's very distinguished people there. The, um, the uh, NSF director, the chancellor of LSU, the president of Caltech. Um, and, um, and so um, they all got together and they, they, they kind of cut the ribbon. And while, while they were still moving earth, and so I dug up this video um, and, um, of, a, um, of, of, of the, the news coverage of that. Let's listen for a minute. In Livingston Parish, where cattle roam free and horses run wild, clear cutting and groundbreaking is taking place to make room for what the National Science Foundation calls one of the most important scientific projects of the century. The project will require the construction of a $75 million observatory, which will feature L-shaped configurations of mirrors, lasers, and pipes encased in concrete arms, stretching 2.5 miles at right angles. It is to detect and analyze a fundamentally new form of radiant energy coming from deep space, the so-called gravitational waves predicted by modern relativistic physics. These waves are considered a key to understanding a wide range of astrophysical phenomenon, including the origins of the universe itself. Oh, so why did Livingston Parish get this big-time science project? Former LSU Chancellor James Wharton explains how it all got started. Well, I read about the project in 1988 in a scientific magazine, mm -hmm. and it just so happens that a couple of our physics faculty Professor Hamilton and Professor Johnson also became interested in the project at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, they contacted me and I contacted the state suggesting that Louisiana ought to make a bid to be one of the sites for LIGO. Louisiana and Washington were chosen two years ago from 170 pairs of proposed sites in 17 states. The sites had to be between 1,500 and 3,000 miles apart, far enough from urban areas to ensure that they were quiet and flat enough to house the observatory arms. Livingston Parish seemed to be the ideal location. Uh, this is a photo of, of, um, of the early stages of building the beam tube arm so that you can see a steel tube there running under a protective cover. That's where we, uh, where the laser goes, and, and we, we we pump the air out of there, so the laser is not interfered with by air and dirt. But the, at the end of that news bit, they said that that Louisiana and Washington State were were the perfect places or ideal places. Turns out it wasn't really true. 
um, the ground vibrates quite a bit in Louisiana uh, for a number of reasons. And so let's talk about how to keep that vibration away from the detector. This is a movie that was made by General Motors in 1938 to demonstrate the smooth ride of General, Motor vehicle, General Motors vehicles uh, that used um, high fancy leaf springs and, and, and dampers. Um, so this shows how it works really. You have a spring and the bumps push, push the wheels up and down and the chassis doesn't move so much. Um, that's really the basis of, of the kind of seismic isolation we use in the initial LIGO detector. We had springs and masses and, 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 and the springs had damping just like this uh, General Motors car. Um, we wanted to make that better when the time came to design advanced LIGO. Um, and, um, and so I got involved in that before I even came to LSU. And the basic idea is that rather than just use the mass and springs, you measure the motion of the payload and you, and you apply a force to it using a servo control system to undo that motion. Um, and this photo on the right is, is an example of that. It's external to the vacuum system it, it and, and three others support the, the payload inside, and there's one of those for each of the each of the ten vacuum tanks, um, and that's hydraulic external pre-isolation. Um, that was being developed for advanced LIGO, but in 2004 we installed it in Livingston, because if we had installed it in Livingston, we never would have been able to run well with Hanford. Um, the pre runs before this was installed were installed. We were had pathetic uptime and we could barely run. So this is when I got here, I realized this is what had to be done. Um, this shows a little bit more of that advanced LIGO isolation system. Um, in addition to the, that external isolation, there's two stages on the inside. They're called ISI, and it's the same technique. You, you measure the motion, we use feedback and feed forward to quiet it. And then we hang from that a multi-stage pendulum system with more passive isolation. And then the test mass, the beautiful, perfect test mass at the very bottom has almost no vibration left in it. And all you see there is what the gravity does. So um, my first grad student um, here, uh, was Shang Wen, um, he worked on that hydraulic, hydraulic external pre-isolation system and, and that, was, that was used in 2004. Um, and um, it was really kind of pioneering work because we had a prototype and it was rushed, rushed, to, conclude, rushed to, to, to completion by a wonderful group of engineers at Caltech and, and Stanford and MIT and, and, and the LSU group all pitched in and made it happen. Um, uh, Shang implemented it sort of in detail in all the tanks and made them all work. Um, and as I mentioned, it was reproduced six years later um, at Hanford when, when Advanced Cyber was installed there. Um, my next student was Rupal Amin, who, who, who was quite involved, in, quite interested in optics. So he worked on, um, he, he tested a novel laser amplifier to be that was intended for Advanced LIGO. That didn't work out so well, but he also, did a great study of how to measure and compensate for beam distortions and heated um, special optics. Um, Ryan DeRosa, um, he was one of the people that was involved in, you know, right on the floor in the control room when we were making the detector work that, 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 that did the discovery. So he implemented the new active seismic isolation system, the ISI that I mentioned, but he also did so, did so much more optimizing um, the global noise reduction of the detector. And then finally, Corey Austin, who, who handed in his thesis just a couple of weeks ago, um, he worked on one of the other noise sources that I haven't mentioned, which is it's possible for tiny amounts of light to scatter out of the beam, scatter off something that isn't seismically isolated, and then improbably make it back into the beam again and add noise. So he, he, he developed software to track the scattered light um, in the detector environs so that we can figure out where ghost beams were and so on, leading, leading to new baffle designs the engineering team made. Um, he, of course, he installed and commissioned those and has been doing a series of measurements to, to um, with Ana Maria Effler, who's also an LSU grad. Um, uh, and he, he also is one of the people that can run the detector and prep the detector for the rec record breaking um, last, last run, 03 run. And getting back to um, the detector, so, so we've, we've, we've made it a long way since those, those first diagrams I showed in the first few slides. You can now see that the detector has lots going on. There's input optics, which is more than just a laser. There's the Michelson interferometer, the two long arms where the, where the, where the light builds up and, can, and, and, and its gravitational wave effects on it increases and magnifies. And then output optics that even includes the little thing on the left, OPO, which is a, 
a squeezed vacuum source that I haven't mentioned yet and there's really no time for. All of those pieces of, op all of those optics have to be aligned um, so, so that the resonant cavities are resonant and the dark, the dark fringe is dark and, and um, everything's pointing in the right direction. That's a lot of degrees of freedom. And, and the process of doing that requires servo mechanisms that are quite complex. This is just one diagram of a few of them. Um, I picked it because uh, Jeff Kissel, who's a, another LSU alum, uh, drew it. And Jeff's really good at these kind of detailed drawings, so it's, it's, it's appropriately scary. Um, to watch all of those degrees of freedom get locked from scratch um, from the control room looks kind of like this. You see all the way on the right and all the way on the left screens that have um, video cameras pointing at the optics in the arms. And when they, when they get bright, and they turn into big white blobs, you can tell that the, the arms are in lock. This is much, much faster than real time, by the way. And this is the detector as it existed around the time of the discovery, not now. And you can see here in the middle, this is a graph of the noise, the detector versus frequency. So this kind of indigo line up top, as it goes, it, it, as it drops down to this reference line, you can, you can watch the progress of the detector catching lock and being uh, reconfigured in real time with, with filter changes and, and amplification stage changes, and then increasing the light power, which is what just happened. And then when they touch, you know it's kind of running at, at, at its nominal, uh, its nominal um, uh, configuration and you're ready to go. So that's the way things kind of felt in August, September, 2015. So then we ran it and um, you can see the two detectors, the one in Hanford on the right and the one in Livingston on the left, saw signals that were remarkably similar, um, wonderfully similar. Um, they're displaced in time by about seven tenths of a second, excuse me, seven and a half milliseconds. Um, and the amplitude is in units of strain, which is change in length over length. And so um, the peak, right when the, right when the black holes touched each other was something like 10 to the minus 21, corresponding to about a thousandth of diameter of a proton motion, equivalent motion of, of, those, of those optics. So this is the diagram that was made uh, on the occasion of the first paper showing the, the way we interpret this graphically. Here are these two black holes um, getting closer and closer. As they get closer, they spin fast, they, they go around faster. So the signal gets both higher in frequency and stronger. And then when they touch and the two event horizons become one, that's where the, approximately the peak power is. And then there's a ring down that isn't, isn't, you can't necessarily see here. Um, so this is, this is that first paper, the discovery paper. And I just mentioned one thing from the abstract, which is that two black holes went in, 36 and 29 solar masses, and one black hole came out, bigger 62 solar masses, with three solar masses of missing, which is radiated as gravita gravitational waves. Um, if you turn that into an energy, it, it's, it was shining more brightly, not really shining, but emitting gravitational waves with more energy by, by a goodly amount than the entire observable universe, all that starlight. Okay, it's a couple years later, we saw a neutron star merger um, that, that, um, that, that was kind of cool. You can see on the right, those are spectrograms of what we saw in LIGO. They take a lot longer than the black holes. So it's, it gets spread over the better part of a minute. Um, and because we had three detectors running and not just two by that time, uh, Virgo was running with us, we were able to pinpoint it on the sky um, and then astronomers could were able to find it with an optical telescope, which is kind of cool. So that was the birth of, of gravitational wave multi-messenger astronomy. Um, all of these little dots were running, uh, observatories saw it at the time, and we wrote a big paper together. Um, since then, we've had a couple, a couple more runs, and, and this is the result of through the first half of the 03 run, which was completed Essentially, it was forced completion when the, when the pandemic hit. And you can see these, um, these uh, yellow dots down here are neutron stars and the vertical axis is, is, is mass and solar masses that had been seen by electromagnetic means. And then the little orange ones are ones we, we saw, that we saw two neutron star mergers. And up here, the purple ones are black holes that have been observed um, by electromagnetic means. And then all the blue ones are ones we've observed. And ours seem to come in, ours come in, in, in 
in groups of three, the two going in and the one coming out. So we give ourselves credit for three black holes for each signal, which is, I think, fair. Anyway, a couple of things about this that are becoming evident now. There seems to be things in this lane here in between the black holes and the neutron stars uh, that has been suspected didn't have anything. So maybe there are things in there and we'll really all understand better. And also some of the largest ones we've seen seem to have masses going in that were larger than we thought that than, than theorists thought could be formed using normal, um, uh, normal solar processes. So maybe, maybe there's more than one stage going on there and they were, these were second generation black hole mergers. There's a lot more to learn there. All right, this last, this last slide just shows if anybody is interested in, in learning more, uh, we have gw-openscience.org where um, the data set through the first two observ observation runs, software to analyze it and uh, sort of demonstration analyses are available um, and with, together with tutorials. This is, the, this is the picture of the people who um, were part of LIGO Livingston at the, around the time of the discovery, um, uh, in, including some familiar faces. Um, and, um, and thank you. I want to uh, say that it's great being at a research university like LSU, where there is support for faculty and, and students to do research. Uh, in particular, I've uh, received uh, faculty research grants from the Office of Research and Economic Development, which are really great for pilot projects to then uh, try to apply for federal money. And uh, I really like that. I also like the opportunity to uh, carry out research both in Belize, where I do archaeology, and in labs at LSU with, with students, both undergraduates and, uh, and graduate students. And so um, we, um, today I'm going to talk about some of the research that I've uh, done at LSU. I have a website, underwatermaya.com, uh, with lots of pictures and videos and things, but I'm not going to attempt it now in case my uh, home internet is a bit unstable. Uh, I'm going to talk about salt today, and you may wonder <laughs> what this has to do with the Maya, but salt, as many of you may know, is very important. It's a biological necessity. Uh, it's uh, something that everybody needs, and the important thing here is that the classic Maya who lived in this area of the Maya area uh, between 300 and 900 AD approximately uh, had a shortage of salt. They had lots of temples and palaces in the, in the rainforest, uh, but they didn't have much salt. So where did they get it? Uh, here are some sources of salt, the red stars. Uh, you can see on the, in the north in the Yucatan, there's um, solar evaporation uh, to gather salt. Along the coast of Belize, salt was made by boiling brine in pots over fires, as, as you see demonstrated here. Uh, I'm going to talk about my research um, at Paynes Creek Salt Works in southern Belize uh, on the, in a saltwater lagoon system. I found four salt works and excavated them, studied the artifacts with, with students, and I published a book, Salt, White Gold of the Ancient Maya. I was measuring a lot of the artifacts and I found that the salt jars and their vessel supports, the salt legs, didn't vary much in their dimensions in comparison to a nearby village of Wild Kang Key. And this gave me the idea that maybe the salt making vessels were standardized in their dimensions because of maybe mass production or they were making a lot. It wasn't just for family needs. It was surplus household production, perhaps. Uh, but I only had four sites, and certainly four sites was not going to produce a lot of salt in comparison to even the nearby inland Maya cities. So I, I realized I wanted to go out and find if there were more sites or not. And certainly some of my colleagues suggested that I need to do that before I um, <laughs> started talking about uh, salt too much. So in 2004, on my sabbatical, I applied for a faculty research grant, and it was the first year of the faculty research grants through ORED. And uh, I applied to do a search for salt works in Punchy Caucus Lagoon, the water, saltwater lagoon system, which forms the major part of Paynes Creek National Park. This is a typical day in the park. It's 
uninhabited. There's no one there. It's beautiful. It's a classic mangrove ecosystem. It's the Caribbean. Um, with the funds, I was able to hire someone with a fast boat to get 30 miles from the nearest town to the park and then 30 miles back rather than me driving an outboard and outboard uh, uh, motor on a, uh, a dugout canoe with my team it would take a lot longer. And so we were doing pedestrian survey, walking in the water, looking for the, the pot shirts that were used for um, making salt. And here's my boat driver, obviously more than a boat driver, part of the team. Um, we were walking and looking uh, for artifacts and stumbling across them. Uh, but we found an unexpected discovery in 2004. We found the very first area we started working, a peat bog below the sea floor. Some of you may be familiar with the, the bog bodies in England and uh, Northern Europe, bodies that are preserved perfectly from thousands of years ago. That's peat, but this is a slightly different kind of peat. It's mangrove peat and it's very acidic. So if there were bodies, they wouldn't have been preserved. So what were we excited about? We found late classic wooden buildings. Here's the first building post that we found. And there's my um, kind of sad looking team. Uh, we excavated this post. I was very skeptical that this was actually a post, but they have sharpened ends and they were formed in rectangular outlines uh, in the sea floor and lots of other construction wood. And they've formed uh, buildings such as these pole and thatch structures in traditional Maya villages in the southern part of Belize, such as San Pedro, Colombia, seen here. Then we found the first ancient Maya wooden canoe paddle at the Kaknab site, four foot seven inches in long. This is moments after discovery, and we put it back in the seafloor because uh, for a couple of months until I was assured that I could get an export permit to take it up to the, the US for uh, preservation. So anything that was in the water, any wood or even the pottery would uh, decay when we take it out. Uh, we took a sample for species identification. It's sapodilla, the chewing gum wood. It's very hard, durable wood. And we took a sample of wood for uh, radiocarbon dating. It's dates to the late classic period of the Maya civilization. So it's not just an old paddle. It's a really, it's a classic Maya old paddle. I saw, when I saw the paddle, I thought instantly of some uh, bone carvings at Tikal in Guatemala, very large ancient Maya city in a burial uh, in, in Temple One, Burial 116. These are the paddler gods and they seem to be holding a paddle, paddles that look just like these with the blade only on one side. However, when we got the paddle back from conservation, I realized it really had been broken off and you can kind of see that here. So it wasn't quite the same. And these guys don't really know how to hold a paddle properly. Um, we had a conservation nightmare with the waterlogged wood uh, and the pottery. The pottery, if we let it dry out, it was salt saturated and so the salt would come to the surface and exfoliate the, the pottery and it would just crumble and the wood would desiccate. So the solution was to create 3D digital images of the waterlogged wood and the pottery. So I started with a grant from the Louisiana Board of Regents to create the Digital Imaging and Visualization in Archaeology or DIVA Lab in 2009. And here's my graduate student Roberto doing a 3D scan of the canoe paddle once we got it back from preservation at Texas A&M using a polymer method. What we found, however, was despite conservation by the best method, uh, the paddle continues to deteriorate. The conservators, Wayne Smith and Helen Devereaux, came over and uh, they said, yes, the cracks were there in antiquity from being in an alternating dry and wet environment, and they're just it's just going to continue to decay. Uh, we took the paddle to Women's Hospital, and they did a CT scan, which shows lots of cracks, and also looks like a, a rind on the outside. This is not the outside of the wood, but the whole paddle is just falling apart. And so 
what I realized was the 3D scan becomes the enduring record. Our goal is to make research quality 3D scans of things that we want to study uh, before they disappear, even when they're uh, conserved. Uh, we made a 3D print of the canoe paddle, full size, four foot seven inches. And uh, it's on permanent display in Belize and Punta Gorda, the nearest town to where we are working. I also had a, a showing, a viewing of the original canoe paddle and people could take their photos with it before I returned uh, the paddle and a 3D replica player to the uh, Belize Government Institute of Archaeology from whom I get permits. And uh, they gave it to the museum who hopes to have it I believe on exhibit at some point. So before I took the original back, I, I laid these out on the floor in the Diva Lab. There's the conserved original canoe paddle. Here's a 3D printed replica from ABS plus plastic, it's very durable. And here it is painted. And here's a uh, part of just the blade uh, printed in wood. And we now have a a huge piece of sapodilla wood that I got exported under a permit from the government of Belize to make a um, full size replica of this out of sapodilla wood. Um, once the pandemic is over, we'll be working again with uh, LSU Mechanical Engineering to print that from our 3D files. I got a local person in Belize to carve a canoe paddle out of sapodilla wood. Uh, the way I thought it would have been with the blade on both sides. And we put it in the water in, we, uh, with the canoe and we paddled in Joe Taylor Creek near Punta Gorda. It, it's a wonderful paddle. We also did 3D printed replicates of Maya artifacts for exhibits in Belize. And these are really great because there's no monetary value on the international antiquities market as there is for many objects from uh, foreign countries. And there's no need for government permission for local communities to display them. Although certainly I, I uh, discussed this with the government uh, archeologists in Belize. And I think importantly, it makes artifacts accessible to the public because you see a 3D image of, of an artifact like this. This is 3D, it's not the original one. And uh, you can see it rather than looking at particularly drawings of artifacts in archaeological reports. And uh, these exhibits and others were funded by a site preservation grant from the Archaeological Institute of America, uh, which uh, we're very grateful to have had. So um, with the discovery of the wood, and I really think the, the canoe paddle, uh, I was able to get funding from National Geographic and a large grant from uh, NSF, Mapping Ancient Maya Wooden Architecture on the Seafloor. And the goal was to find sites, to map them, and to date them. And here you see the snorkeling, happy archaeologists in the water, um, holding up some artifacts they found on the seafloor. Uh, here you see a team shoulder to shoulder on research flotation devices. And uh, in this movie, you can see the team at the canoe paddle site. This is after we found the canoe paddle and we wanted to map the whole site. I was standing in the water with a digital DVD camera filming them. They were paying no attention to me, but I was able to get the movie. You see that they're looking and when they find something, they take a flag out and uh, put it in the sea floor. This system worked really well for uh, finding sites in shallow water, uh, for mapping and for excavating uh, these shallow underwater sites, but not for deep sites. Uh, we uh, set up a total station on some dry land, it's hard to find, and dry firm land, and then put our prism pole in the water on the top of each post to map them in, downloaded the digital data at night and put it into uh, a GIS. Each dot here represents a post. This is only part of the area. We found and actually mapped 4,042 wooden building posts at 70 underwater sites, which I discussed in my uh, recent book, Maya Salt Works from University Press of Florida. Uh, we have posts at 30 more sites, but they're either in water that's too deep or uh, they're too remote to, um, to map with a total station. We have GPS locations on them. And we know where they are. 
Um, after that, I, I thought, I really need to find out answers to some other things about this research. You may have been thinking, why are the sites underwater? When did they become submerged? We talk about this a lot, but I wanted to try to address these issues. So I sought out colleagues who were experts in different areas, um, including Dr. Karen McKee, who is a mangrove ecologist, and she um, became a co-PI on a, a new project, and she cored the lagoon system and uh, to uh, look at uh, sea level rise and uh, what the Maya were doing uh, in this mangrove swamp. Also, um, Dr. Harry Roberts, Many people at LSU should know uh, Dr. Roberts, marine geologist. He had his tech design a automated research vessel for shallow water for doing side scan sonar. And this was incredibly exciting to see this about going back and forth systematically uh, traversing uh, the lagoon system and picking up the data on uh, the boat in the, in the, um, uh, the computer on the boat. Um, we found some uh, shell middens that uh, were above the silt on the sea floor and um, found uh, areas to look with. Harry also brought a, um, a drone, one of the first use of drone in uh, Belize in 2011. Actually, we called it a foam kite, but we got really good aerial views of our, our sites. Then the other person on this collaborative uh, NSF was a former uh, LSU PhD geography grad of mine, Terry Weimiller, who took my 2D GIS and made it into 3D. And here's a computer animation that he made, uh, certainly a lot easier because you can't see the sites, the underwater sites. There's a big underwater site right here, but you can't see it. Um, so a lot of this research is still in progress. Uh, we also excavated 10 shallow underwater sites. We set up a, a grid frame for excavations and then use these one by one meter frames weighted down on the sea floor and uh, then excavate. Uh, this is one of my former students, undergraduate honor student, Taylor Oakland, who just graduated with a PhD in history. And then we would ferry them offshore. There's the excavation, ferry them offshore to be um, screened in the sea and then we had a lagoon lab to wash off the silt and so forth um, my helper but we had these deep water sites and here's a better view of part of the lagoon system it extends even farther and we've we've found sites in in many of these these areas uh, and in the larger area over here uh, in 2015 i got a l2 faculty research grant to use uh, some diving equipment to dive these deeper sites. Here is the site that we had hoped to excavate this year in March. We were ready and packed to go with our tickets and our dive gear uh, for three months and then the pandemic hit. We're still ready to go whenever we can. Uh, this was a great system. It's a um, gas powered compressor uh, that forces air through hoses to special regulators for the divers. Each diver has a tender to watch for bubbles, make sure there still are bubbles and to, to assist. It's, um, it's really loud and noisy, but uh, it works really well because we could stay down on the seafloor and excavate from there. And this really transformed, there's our lifeguard and here's the, dive gear, which we take on the plane, weighs less than 50 pounds. So it's a great system. So what does all this mean? I used examples of the Maya, the modern Maya and historic Maya uh, making salt at salt springs in the, in the highlands, such as Sacapulas. So here's a couple of salt workers who are pouring salty water into pots over fire and until there's no more water left and then they harden these uh, pots over the fire and they make salt cakes. And here you see a dump pile where they've broken off the, the pottery and just dumped it over here. That's what we found. This is typical from our excavations, bricotage, salt making, 
pottery from the Paines Creek salt kitchens. Here's a salt kitchen, the plan view showing uh, the posts, the different colors are different sizes. We measured each one. And what I found is it's not really kind of a Caribbean beach party, let's go out and make some salt. No, this is a more serious endeavor. They were making it in houses and um, they were um, making a lot of salt. I estimated that, for example, 10 salt kitchens could produce salt for about 24,000 Maya a year. So if we had 100 salt kitchens, 100 sites, some of the sites had more than one salt kitchen. But if I just took 10 salt kitchens, that could yield 7,500 pounds a week or 120,000 pounds over a 16 week dry season in Belize. And that's using uh, an estimate of six grams a day per person of salt, which ends up being about five pounds of salt a year. That's a lot of salt, but we need salt. Um, I have a lot of these, more of these statistics uh, in my Maya Salt Work book. But it wasn't all used for dietary salt. They were also apparently salting fish. I gave uh, church tools to my colleague Kazuo Ayoama, who is a leading expert on studying the uh, use wear of stone tools. He had done experiments on modern stone tools that he made, that he used on different materials. And then he examined the edges of the stone tools under a microscope and determined different patterns of use wear. So he used this knowledge to look at the Paines Creek uh, stone tools made of chert and uh, determined that very few of them, all of these and more were used for cleaning fish, very few were used for uh, cutting wood. And interestingly, these points, the pointy end was not used at all. They were more like knives. They were used for cutting and scraping. Uh, so we, uh, we wrote this article, uh, came out in PNAS, uh, one of the highlights of 2018 for me was being interviewed on Science Friday uh, with Ira Flato. It's uh, really wonderful. This article, you can just get it uh, open access if you want to read the details. So what was going on? I think there was regional trade of salt in the Maya area. It wasn't long distance trade of salt. It was coming from mul multiple sources and it was well integrated into surplus household production going to markets and uh, all around the Maya area. And so on the northern coast of the Yucatan, they were getting solar evaporation salt um, along the coast of Belize, uh, not just at the Paines Creek Salt Works, but I estimate at other salt works along the coast where there isn't wood, but they were probably also were using a similar technology. They were making salt there and also in uh, the highlands at several, not just two, but several more of these uh, salt springs, uh, they were also making salt. And so I estimated clearly there was enough. If you had 5 million Maya, they would need about 15,000 tons of salt a year. Just the North Coast could produce 20,000 tons a year. Now we know that the density of population in the Maya area was probably higher from all the LIDAR that was going on. Um, but we still had questions like, where did the my, where did the people live? How was the production uh, organized? How was it distributed? And so, uh, former doctoral student Dr. Corey Sills, uh, LSU uh, PhD in geography, 2013, just earned her um, became an associate professor at University of Texas and Tyler. We uh, submitted and got an NSF grant to do underwater excavations, looking for residences, looking for evidence of other activities to see how these family businesses operated, how they survived, how they succeeded, how they failed, how they were integrated into the economy. So in 2019, we excavated at one of the big sites with 10 uh, wooden buildings. We found more when we were there. They're very hard to find. Uh, Tabnik Na and um, we planned, as I said, to work at Equinal, uh, another large site with at least 10 wooden buildings. And some of you may have heard of the jadeite gouge with the rosewood handle was found at building 10 right there. But 
the field work in 2020 was canceled. We're not sure what's going on in 2021, 2022, but we are persistent. Um, and in June of this year, I applied and received, I guess I applied in May, but I received permission, early access to labs uh, to continue the research. So I started just going into the lab and figuring out how I was gonna organize research during a pandemic. And in July, I received permission for my graduate students to come into the lab and they changed their research, which was already approved for doing dissertation and thesis work at Equinol to studying the material that we had exported under permit uh, from Tabnuk Na. And so uh, students were very diligent about safety and health and dedicated to doing the research. I have some acknowledgements, uh, a lot of acknowledgements uh, from, I appreciate getting funding from the National Science Foundation. I learned a lot of skills at the NEH MSU Institute for Digital Archaeology Method and Practice, but faculty research grants from the Office of Research, other funding, and in particular, I would like to note, um, I appreciate getting permits for many years from the Belize Institute of Archaeology allowing me to work in Belize as a foreigner. Um, and in particular, the current director of the Institute, Dr. John Morris, and the former uh, director, Dr. Hami Awe, and their staff. Also, I'd like to extend uh, a gra gratitude to our host family, where we live in the jungle with John, Tanya, Lyra, and Nathaniel Spang, and also to many LSU current and former uh, graduate and undergraduate students who have participated in the research, enjoyed the fun, and done a lot of really hard work. Others, uh, the LSU Cartographic Information Center has been a great support to us, as well as uh, many areas on the LSU campus, including our Department of Geography and Anthropology, the College of Humanities and Social Sciences, who supported us getting a um, gypsum color printer, which is pretty exciting. This pot came out of the printer like this in color. Um, it's from Wild Kanki. Uh, so stay tuned if you want to go for updates. Uh, we also are on social media and especially Facebook. We have a under Maya, Underwater Maya Research Group page where we post what we've been doing in, during the pandemic. Thank you very much. One of the things that I have always enjoyed about your work is the way in which you're you're also adapting um, uh, some contemporary digital technologies in in what many of us have always thought of archaeology as being a rather dusty uh, kind of activity. Maybe that's uh, that's that that, that that's a, a stereotype of uh, from from older movies. Uh, but uh, but but I, I've always been very uh, uh, I, I've always felt that to be uh, a really engaging part of the work that you're doing. Um, so I, I'd like to remind our audience that um, uh, we're now at our uh, Q&A period. If you have questions that you'd like to ask, please go ahead and put them in the Q&A section and we will um, we will uh, uh, convey them to. Uh, our presenters. Um, but to kind of get you started, um, you know, both uh, uh, Dr. McCullough and, and Dr. Jiami, both of your work um, uh, centers around discovering things that, that, that we haven't been able to see before, things that, that haven't, been, um, uh, haven't been visible to us, and that you're finding a way to to discover that through the technology means that you have or the manual processes that you're using and provide representation so that we can understand what it is that you're exploring and what it is that you're doing. Um, I have to imagine that there's a certain amount of exhilaration that happens when you've made that initial big discovery, which each of you have, have had. And I, and I really would like to Kind of get feedback from you on on what your thoughts were when when say uh, Dr. Jiami when you um, when, when you first learned that that the that uh, that LIGO had worked and it had and the discovery of the first uh, uh, collision uh, and for Dr. McCullough the, the same as you know you, you you're discovering 
it, you, you came to Belize to look for a certain kind of uh, set of artifacts and instead you found something that, that completely transformed the way that you look at your research. What, was, what were your expression, what were your thoughts on that? Um, Dr. Giammi, if we could start with you. It happened, it happened in, the, in the wee hours of the morning and so by the time, um, uh, by the time we, at least, at least in our time zone, by the time we got up, um, there was already some mail, co email correspondence about it. Um, it was right at the beginning of the run. So um, we had almost no information about how that detector was gonna run. And, um, and the only thing I would probably point out is that in, er in earlier runs, just serendipitously, I, I, I had this sort of side role as some, someone who, who injected fake signals. Um, and, um, and so I wasn't involved in that capacity for, for, for the run with discovery, but it was kind of on my mind, like, are, you know, is, is that what happened? Um, and Gabriel Gonzalez at that time was the spokesperson for the collaboration. And, um, and so I, I didn't really truly believe it until both she and the director of the LIGO lab um, promised me that they hadn't authorized any such thing. <laughs> or that it hadn't happened. So that was one thing going through our mind. Um, and um, the other thing going through our mind is that, you know, the, the, the people who take care of the statistics for us said, you got to run for, for weeks and weeks without changing anything so that we can build up statistics. And this thing is actually, you can write a paper about it. Um, so there was, we kind of all turned inward and, 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 and made sure that that, that happened, that, 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 that no one messed with anything, that the, that the priority turned from the usual run at beginning of the run worries to this is a particular thing we have to do in order to, in order to bag this science and take it home. Many other things are going through our minds, but, but that, that's what I would share now. Dr. McKillop, how about you? Well, we were out on survey walking in waist deep water, rubber boots to protect our feet, bathing suits, sun hats, and you know, I was carrying a camera and notebook, my bathing suit straps in plastic bags. And we were in a mangrove swamp. And my boat driver, who's from Belize, said, hey, man, there's posts here. And I thought, you know, I, I, we're in a swamp. There's wood. There's things sticking out, uh, old dead trees and, and all sorts of things. But there did seem to be um, a lot of things sticking in the seafloor. And so, uh, but barely protruding, like there was a layer of silt and then hard peat and wood barely protruding and you couldn't see anything. And so, and we were ill prepared for excavating, but I said, okay, we're gonna excavate one of these so-called posts. And if it's a post, it's gonna go straight down and it's gonna be pointed at the end, it's gonna be sharpened. And if it's um, a, a tree root, it's gonna go like this. And if it's just a stray piece of wood, it's going to go off in stray angles. And so we, um, we didn't have any excavation gear, but um, a couple of us like to just exhale and dive down and hold on to the seafloor and dig around the post or the piece of wood. And finally, it was loose and I, it was floating a bit and I raised it out of the water and raised it finally and found a sharpened, this is a 3D print, a sharpened end of this meter long post that, that I showed you. And I said, it's a post, you know, I get to say things because it's my project. And they, and my boat driver says, yeah, man. I mean, he believed it. But at that point it was, wow, wood doesn't preserve in the rainforest. We have all these stone temples. Uh, later on, you know, my colleagues like, how come you've got the wood? What do you mean? You've got temples in the jungle. But you know, this is the only place where there's wooden architecture just all over the place. And so um, we started looking around and we found a bunch of more of these things and uh, we marked them. And, you know, people looked at me again, and said, what is it? And I said, well, you know, it's a, a salt shed for making salt. And it's not too far off now. We call it a salt kitchen. But then this was site 15 of that year. And so I thought, what could be at the other site? So we we went back to site 14 and one of my students was being, Kevin was being uh, pretty quiet off in a corner and uh, working at something. So we all just sort of 
swam over like vultures and helped him out. And it turned out to be the canoe paddle. I just happened to have a 3D printed replica right here, Andy. And so uh, we found that. And that was just absolutely stunning because no canoe had ever been found. No canoe paddle had ever been found. And so, and it just, you know, full size wood. It was beautiful. But we had to put it back. And we put it back and weighted it down. And then two months later at the archaeology, Belize Archaeology Symposium, I went up to the director, then uh, Dr. Jaime Awe, my friend and fellow classmate at Trent University in Canada. I said, Jaime, if, if, um, if I apply for a permit, will you give it to me? And he said, oh, yes, of course. And I was so uh, surprised at that. I actually dropped my plate of food on the floor. It was paper plate. Uh, but I was, you know, so nervous about it. So we went back and, and brought this up. So we were just absolutely surprised. I mean, to find all this wood, and it completely changed uh, the direction of the research. But it's all still about salt, and we still get a lot of bricotage. But it was yeah. pretty thrilling, I must admit, for all of us. We we have a I, I have to imagine that that it's it, it has to be thrilling um, uh, to make these kinds of to have these kinds of aha moments, especially when they when when they really kind of come at the pinnacle of of the the, the work that you've done, that it represents such a, a tremendous amount of time of effort um, uh, to bring these things together. Um, I, I do have a question uh, from our audience from Dr. for Dr. Giami. What would you consider to be the most important finding of your work on gravitational waves to date? Well, I, I, I think that the, um, the one that I became very invested in is, is the, um, together with a, a colleague from Hanford who's kind enough to join, Mike Landry, um, the, two of us, um, the two of us somehow uh, were, were tapped to help to, to, to lead the writing of the paper for that neutron star multi-messenger detection. And, um, and and, and so the merger that happened there um, was not just neutron stars. It was a merger between um, kind of instrumentalist oriented um, gravitational wave scientists who had seen nothing astrophysical for their whole lives with workaday astronomers who had, who, who had really strong feelings about how, how such a paper should be written. There were 3,500 authors um, and, um, and, mm -hmm. and that was something. That was something. Um, so what did we what, what did we demonstrate that that world peace might be possible? World peace through science sounds very actually sounds very Star Trek actually. But uh, uh, yeah, no, I, I I could absolutely see that. Uh, Dr. McCulloch, we have a, a question actually from our VPR um, uh, uh, Sam Bentley who asks. Um, what kind of remote sensing technologies would you want to pursue for future mapping of the seabed in, in this area? What kinds of resources that, that you haven't used yet do you think would be ideal or, 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 or fruitful in pursuing more of the work that you're doing uh, without having to dive down to the seabed floor? Yeah, we, um, uh, Harry Roberts and I talked about this, and I think uh, the thing, the problem with uh, the lagoon system is, first of all, the signature of wood, the wood posts, resembles the signature of the mangrove peat. They're both, you know, organic plant matter and highly dense, and so it's difficult to, uh, to distinguish them. And the, uh, the second problem is there's a, a thick layer of dense silt on the mangrove peat that varies in, in depth that obscures um, a lot of the uh, remote sensing signatures, uh, in particular what, what um, Harry brought down, the side scan sonar. I think a sub-bottom profiler uh, we had hoped to be able to take down, and um, I think that might help. But at this point, uh, and certainly in other lagoon systems, that might help and maybe in uh, the deeper water areas of, of the lagoon system would certainly be, be worthwhile. It was really quick and easy to use uh, uh, the 
uh, automated research vessel. It, uh, it was in two pieces and shipped down, and then we put it back together and took it out uh, to uh, where we lived and then took it out to the lagoon system. And um, it, it works, really, works really well. So I think a sub-bottom profiler might work. I think uh, now knowing the depth of the mangrove peat uh, from Karen McKee's research, uh, and sort of the, the depth of the Maya, the Maya use of the lagoon system is, is really uh, recent, uh, but it goes back at least uh, 4,000 years uh, in terms of the mangrove and fits in with the, um, the mangroves, uh, mangrove cores in, uh, in the beyond uh, in the sea. Um, but what we found for finding things is shoulder to shoulder going, traversing back and forth, we find these things because they're small and uh, sure the, the, the side scan sonar picked them up because we put them over some of the, the flags and the, the posts were flagged and, and they do pick them up. Um, and I think uh, we'll see, we hope to be doing some more survey using uh, the, uh, the dive gear that we've got in the deeper water. Um, but um, I think uh, at this point, uh, um, yeah, we'd like to use some. LIDAR is not going to work because it's, uh, it's too deep. Um, so it's really uh, people swimming and looking and feeling. Right. right. That so somehow the, the, that sometimes the best technology is just getting in there with your, with your hands and, and making it happen. Yeah, in um, a very systematic way. Right. So, um, Joe, uh, uh, the I, I know that um, uh, through my own conversations with with Gabi and uh, and with you that that some really remarkable technologies had to be developed to uh, uh, to make all of this happen. And in, in the same way that the you know the, the space program a lot of technologies that grew out of the necessity of building for space have become products that we now use on a daily basis uh, in, in kind of a terrestrial way. Are there, do you see any, any things that, uh, that have been developed specifically for the gravitational interferometers um, that could have future applications in ways that we that we aren't really even thinking about right now that that might have commercial benefit for us uh, uh, into the future. Yeah, I mean, I, I, the way the way I, I usually answer that question is that is that people who go through students and others who go through our labs, um, they 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 learn how to somehow re repress the idea. That, that something's impossible because we're, we're measuring ridiculously small lengths and, and um, things that are really far away and might not exist. And, um, and I'd like to think that alone um, uh, sets, themselves, sets them up for, for discoveries. I think, I think um, the fact that we have such a complicated system that has so many parts that, that the sort of mainstream engineers would call cutting edge or bleeding edge even um, is another is another lesson that that um, you know probably serves them serves them well. Um, I'm, I can't anticipate anything that no one's thought of yet because I'm no smarter than no, than anybody. So, but I think I think it has to do with that. It has to do with um, can, you know complicated systems really making things converting things from being bleeding edge to to, to being able to work every day um, are important. I should mention that that be, between Gabi and me, we've got four, maybe more, four four PhDs uh, uh, graduates who who moved their careers to work on space based um, gravitational wave detectors in, in that, at NASA, um, and so um, I think I think that they're probably set up pretty well to, to contribute there. That's great, uh, Dr. McCullough. Uh... How are local communities involved with your work? Do you, I mean, you, I, I know that you've, you've mentioned that there's a local family that you stay with, but how are the broader communities, both uh, uh, 
and 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 if you if you know how um, how uh, indigenous communities are involved with your work and how have you engaged them? You're you're on mute. Sorry. There we go. No problem. <clears throat> well, there's um, there's no I have absolutely no one uh, living in the whole area. Uh, 30 miles around uh, where we do the research. So once we leave, leave the modern community of Punta Gorda, uh, there's no one. There's no one living there. Uh, uh, the Maya were there. Um, so interacting with the communities, we interact with the very diverse community of Punta Gorda. Um, and then uh, the Maya communities, the Maya mainly live in small villages away from Punta Gorda, but there's been a mass movement of, of Maya people uh, to the a new community outside of Punta Gorda to provide education and opportunities for their children. And uh, the Institute of, Institute of Archaeology, Government of Police, really, they don't really want archaeologists going out and doing much unless they approve it. So I think the major thing that we do is people, and that was very effective. And then I realized that everybody in Belize has a cell phone and they use Facebook. And I know the youth in America and Canada don't use Facebook. It's for old people. But the youth, I've been told, and I do this, youth in Belize use Facebook for uh, phones. They go to the phone office to make a, a call, or they call the radio station, and you know, and now they go to the radio station and announcements would be made over the radio station on Facebook. And, and I am friends with a lot of people. Uh, both uh, Maya people and uh, other people up in uh, in Punta Gorda, and uh, we also um, have a connection with uh, Love FM uh, TV and radio, and a newscaster for Love FM National. He always wants a press release, and he'll come out and be the MC of openings of our exhibits. And then we got the director of the TV and radio station in Belize City nationwide, Love FM. Dr. Rene Villanueva came down with his team uh, and did a two hour documentary on our project, which uh, aired on uh, Belize TV. And they gave me a copy of a Belize watch. And uh, so they're very, Belizeans know about our project. And I've taken um, objects up to the radio station, the TV, NSF project. Corey and I uh, wrote and what we ha had planned to do, I'm not really sure how we can do it with the pandemic, was to actually um, have a uh, series of, of meetings with uh, people who wanted to come, hopefully people in Maya villages who still construct these pollen patch structures or at least know, know uh, of their their family having done this and uh, and share information. Well, we would share information and see if they're interested in you know what we find, the different kinds of wood species, the size of house, the construction, um, pull and patch buildings were used for, um, and if they can give us some insights, but particularly just to to share that information. Uh, I've given a lot of public talks in town. And uh, my students hate walking through town with me because I talk with everyone. But it's going to be hard with the pandemic. Yeah, I would imagine so. I would imagine so. Um, uh, we have a great question that I'd actually like to wrap up with from with, with a response from both of you. It's from uh, Dr. Uh, Jeffrey Blackman. Um, and, and he writes about that there's a common theme between both of your um, your research uh, in the in terms of stories being stories of persistence, 
the public and funding agencies sometimes have hard times with projects that take a long time and with patience. And as Dr. Blackman says, the admittedly slow arc of science. Um, and uh, so I, I, he, he'd like to, to have you talk a little bit about how your stories of discovery might better inform uh, not only agencies, but the public at large about the larger scientific process. And um, so we could just uh, get a, a response from both of you on that. Dr. Jami, if you'd like to start. Yeah, it's a really good question. I don't just say that because my, he's my department chair. Um, <laughs> the, the, um, I, I, I really do try to, to um, when, when speaking to the public in particular, you know, in ancient times when we could have science Saturdays at the observatory and, and have people show up for that. Um, I hope, I hope we get back to that when in those sorts of settings where, where members of the public kind of brought themselves and their families out. I always, always, always um, uh, work into the story that the role of the, of the NSF and the taxpayers and that almost unique um, uh, it, it about, about what can be done at the federal level is that long, long arc um, of, of taking risks and, and, and sticking to it over, over decades. Um, and, um, you know, I, I think LSU is in, is, in this, is in this category as well for how long it's been, how, how long it, it put resources and, 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 and intellectual support behind this before anything happened. Um, but I think the other thing is I try to get, you know, maybe it's one, I, I think that if more people saw the connection between, you know, between their taxes and and long-term cool stuff that has nothing to do with, you know, with with um, with controversy and everything to do with with seeing cool, learning cool things about science and the universe, I think that I think maybe things would be a little less um, uh, neurotic um, uh, on, on the political scale. But I, what do I know? I'm a physicist. Um, um, I try to make that point. Um, and both observatories have science education centers now. Hanford's in, in construction, um, and, um, and 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 we've chosen to, to emphasize connections to underrepresented groups. We have a wonderful multi-decade collaboration with Southern University going on in science education, and um, uh, both in, both both in terms of teachers and 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 students. Um, Hanford has has opportunity to reach out to Native American groups and, and Hispanic serving institutions, and and um, and that's worked out really well for us. And I and I hope for 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 the uh, the folks who participate in it. Um, not sure if that was part of your question. Over. Sure, Dr. McCullough, how about you? Um, <clears throat> well, I think. Um, Persistence is uh, is a key to things, and it is hard. I spend a lot of time uh, applying for grants and get enough to do the research. And sometimes uh, I've been able to get uh, major funding, but I think a lot of it is uh, kind of the serendipity of research, what funding agencies are interested in, uh, what the federal government is interested in, which is not climate change. So uh, my project, with uh, sea level rise and uh, inundation, the word Maya um, become unpopular. But I think uh, you have to really like what you're doing and you have to work hard at it. I tell my students in, in Belize that, you know, first of all, safety is, there's three words, safety, fun, and research. You know, safety is really an important thing. And certainly with, uh, you know, being in a foreign country and really remote, uh, but um, you have to really enjoy it because it's a lot of hard work and and that, you know, it is the students that I take down are doing real research. And occasionally we find uh, we're always looking for things and trying to problem solve, which is one of the, the great things about archaeology, uh, having discussions about how things could have been and trying to figure out what kind of evidence. So it's not just uh, the scientific process of discovery. It's not just having research goals and some um, hypotheses with uh, test implications, but it's an ongoing uh, process of discovery 
and discovering new things and then coming up with new hypotheses. So the whole process of science, scientific discovery um, is unfolding uh, in, in the field. Uh, in archaeology, I, I think I'm pretty lucky uh, because there's lots of jobs uh, related to environmental review. And so my students who earn masters and PhDs often will, uh, you know, if they don't get a job at a university, which most of the PhDs do, uh, will get a job at a consulting company and are, you know, they're, they're, that's where the high paying jobs are. Uh, so there's lots of jobs at all levels for uh, people in, in archaeology. Uh, and so I don't have any qualms about trying to get people excited about it. Uh, most archaeology is funded by archaeological field schools, uh, by basically, you know, students learning while they're, uh, uh, they're excavating, uh, excavating a site. Um, but I think uh, persistence really pays off and dedication and ex being excited about what you're you're doing and uh you know i love working in the water i'm you know I, that's the place where i like to be so uh being out in a boat swimming that's my environment but it's not the environment that most archaeologists want well thank you both thank you very much um, thank you for such a fantastic discussion about your work, and congratulations on the recognition of the DRM. Um, it really is a high honor, and uh, I can't think of two people more deserving of it. For our audience, we really appreciate you helping us recognize and celebrate these, and celebrating these two outstanding researchers. Before we sign off, I want to thank everyone in our office who helped put tonight's program together, Holly Carruth, Allison Satake, Kristen Dennis. Thank you all for everything that you've done. And thank you all for joining us tonight. Good evening.